very warm welcome to another episode in Doorway to Sell, a webinar series presented by Sindhi Culture Foundation and the Embassy Group. We seek to share a glimpse of Sindhi history and culture to the diaspora and those interested in our heritage from which we have been divorced. Today we look at the earliest Hindu text and see how the mighty Sindhu is mentioned in the Rig Veda and the many mentions of the kingdom Sindhu Saoveda in the Vedas, Mahabharata, and inscriptions on rock carvings at Girnar and the text Griya Samista. I welcome Dr. Sucheta Paranspe and Dr. Shilpa Sumant to take us into the realm of this sacred text. I now welcome Ms. Amrita Sadarangani Rana to continue. I'm very pleased to moderate this uh, webinar uh, hosted by the Sindhi Culture Foundation. I am executive director to the Gujarat Biotechnology University Project, a novel higher education partnership between the world leading University of Edinburgh and the Gujarat government to create a new institution, placing innovation and excellence at its core to deliver biotechnology solutions for society's needs. I led the University of Edinburgh South Asia Regional Center from 2010 to 20, and I'm interested in the transformational power of and the future of higher education. I'm very pleased to uh, share a little information about Dr. Sucheta Paranjpe. Uh, Dr. Paranjpe came the merit list of SSC with two gold medals, nine prizes and national open merit scholarships and opted for the arts to learn and teach Sanskrit as was her goal for life. Uh, Dr. Paranjpe topped the University of Pune at the bachelor's and master's levels and completed her PhD in Vedic studies. Dr. Paranjpe was a professor of Sanskrit and Indology at the Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Peet and worked at the Bandarkar Institute in the Mahabharat project. Uh, Dr. Paranjpe is Infosys Fellow at Ma uh, Bandarkar Institute and taught Sanskrit in Leipzig in University, Germany, as well as McAllister College, St. Paul in the USA. Uh, Dr. Paranjpe worked as India Director for Associated Colleges of Midwest Chicago and gave talks on Akashwani and other social platforms on subjects related to Sanskrit. She has written many research papers and articles, edited two books, and written three. Uh, Dr. Paranjpe has won many prizes and awards, and the most valuable amongst them uh, is that she was honored to become Fellow of the Ferguson College. Welcome, Dr. Paranjpe. We're very pleased Thank and you. to have you. Dr. Shilpa Samant has been a sub-editor in the Sanskrit Dictionary Project and assistant professor at the Department of Sanskrit and Lexicography at the Deccan College Postgraduate and Research Institute in Pune since 2009. A doctoral research topic was Viva, the development of ritual from Samhit to Prayog in the Atharva Veda tradition from Tilak Maharashtra Vidyapit, Pune in 2007. Uh, Dr. Samant has taught uh, undergraduate and postgraduate courses in Sanskrit for, last, for the last 24 years in renowned institutions in Pune and has guided three PhDs and one MPhil uh, and is currently guiding one student for her PhD for a PhD degree in Sanskrit and lexicography in the Deccan College Postgraduate and Research Institute. Dr. Sumant has participated in 46 national and international conferences and symposia and has delivered 18 invited lectures in India and abroad. Dr. Sumant has published two books, one edited volume, editor of the annals, and is editor of the annals of Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute. A uh, very warm welcome to this very interesting um, webinar, which I am very much looking forward to. Could you tell us, Dr. Paranjpe, how is the Vedic literature and culture related to the River Sindhu? See, first of all, let me be very clear that Rugveda, we are going to focus more on Rugveda. It is the oldest available literature in the entire world. So that has a special value and significance for everybody. And therefore, talking about Rugveda is a pleasure always. The thing is, there has been this Indus Valley civilization, which I would rather call Sindhu Sanskriti, whereas Rugveda is more or less Saraswata Sanskriti. They came from Sindhu River, from Multan and all. The original name was Mulasthanam. 
that is the original place of their residence. From there, they came down uh, southeast and they settled on the banks of Saraswati. In spite of that, Saraswati, Ganga, Yamuna, there are 21 rivers mentioned in Rubeda, but Sindhu has a special difference because Sindhu was the first river where they settled down and uh, so much so that there is one Rushi or one, <clears throat> we can say, author who has written in Rugveda. His name is Sindukshit Prayamena. So his name is Prayamena, but he's Sindukshit. That is, he lived on the banks of Sindhu River. So this is a direct connection. I mean, for the first time, I got this direct connection. Then there are many suktas. Sukta is a Rugvedic poem. There are many suktas which mention the river Sindhu. So Sindhu is like their mother. Okay. And <clears throat> later on, they started respecting and revering the Sindhu river so much that for them, any and every river became Sindhu. You get my point? So what happens is, just as nowadays we say Ganga. <clears throat> so we have Paina Ganga, Vana Ganga, this Ganga, that Ganga. Similarly, in those days, everything became Sindhu. And therefore, they talk about Sapta Sindhu. Doesn't mean there were seven rivers named Sindhus, but Sindhu was the best one for them. And therefore, all the rivers are called Sindhu. Sindhu was a dear river to them because in the beginning, they have the Vedic Aryans have stayed on the banks of river Sindhu. Even today in Ladakh, we still have Sindhu river, but that's a very small river there. And later on, it becomes big. One important thing is the word Sindhu is also synonymous. I mean, these people thought that it was like an ocean and therefore they did this that Sindhu also came to mean an ocean. So since the Vedic culture flourished, was born and was enriched on the banks of the river Sindhu, along with many other rivers, the importance of the river Sindhu it can be clearly seen in Rugveda. Thank you very much. Uh, that is a fascinating start to the connections between Vedic literature and uh, Sindhu. How advanced was this culture? And could you give us a brief outline of the literature? As Dr. Paranspe said, uh, that uh, the origin of uh, Vedic culture was uh, on the banks of Sindhu. Uh, I would like to a little bit go further and say that uh, from today's Afghanistan up to uh, today's Ganges, uh, Ganga, uh, this particular um, Vedic culture, or we can say uh, which origina originated in uh, Sindhu uh, has expanded. And uh, we get the references of this uh, in uh, the Vedic uh, suktas. Uh, we can call them hymns or poems of the Rugveda, which is the oldest available literature for us. Uh, this literature, uh, this uh, Veda was very advanced. Uh, we will talk, go on talking on this uh, during our talk more, uh, but to give you a little bit idea that how it flourished. Basically, these, um, these people, they were settling in this uh, particular area. Uh, near Sindhu or Sapta Sindhu. And uh, what they were looking around, all those surroundings, uh, they were uh, very much attracted to. And uh, later on, they were thinking that these are their deities. So basically, their gods or their divinities are the natural uh, things which are around them. So naturally, they revered the river Sindhu and other rivers on which, on the banks of which they were residing. And also um, other things like uh, the, the daily phenomena of sunrise, sunset, before that even the dawn. So all these uh, natural phenomena which they, um, they were witnessing every day, uh, they become, became their divinities. 
so in this manner ushas came as dawn then there is surya sun then there is wind and all these deities they are the natural uh, phenomena what they did that they started praising their deities and in this manner these poems this rigvedic poetry came into existence all was this spontaneous overflow of their feelings they are, uh, for their uh, for their surroundings and um, later on what they did so this uh, probably this was the first generation of poets uh, in uh, in vedic literature we do not call them poets or authors but we call them seers because they visioned everything and that is why they are called seers in uh, in vedic language we call rushi so they were the ones who witnessed these poems and then what they did they give they transmitted all their knowledge to their next generation the next generation then collected all the material from their predecessors and they themselves go uh, went on adding into them and in this manner this particular vedic literature uh, is the effort of generations together and uh, to mind you to tell you that this particular literature was transmitted through oral tradition so from one tradition to another tradition it was going uh, from one generation to other generation it was transmitted orally and in this manner this particular literature it expanded a lot and then at some point they decided to make some um, a feasible arrangement so that uh, it can be perceived by everyone uh so then what they did that they uh, they selected some families of the seers and a uh, literature from their family uh, was collected together and in this manner now we have seven family books in rugveda and the other uh, sections in uh, the other books in in total there are 10 books but the other books they are miscellaneous uh, where uh, many other Uh, poets many other uh, seers uh, have contributed uh, so i think uh, professor paranspe may add something more in this no I you have know. got the gist of it all but yes rugveda is edited <clears throat> all the suktas the poems were collected collated and done i mean the great editing work has gone in that and please remember in those times there was no script no sukta was written down and therefore we always say it was composed we never say it was written and so just imagine the intelligence of these people who remembered everything they heard everything that was the only way of getting knowledge and they remembered everything and on an abstract level they did all this editing stuff in spite of all the modern gadgets that we have like computers and then you know at the tip of our fingers we have everything alphabetization everything but these people did that and believe me there is not a single mistake there is not a single typo there so it is really amazing and it is called samhita samhita is the edited text so that is why rugveda is called rugveda samhita that is fascinating thank you dr suman uh, dr paranjpe could you tell us a little bit more about how we understand in uh, today's context the role of transmission you know how do we understand this process of editing which came through orally finally to written literature in the context of our understanding of you know the evolution of the vedas as well as the contextualization against sindh if that makes sense i would like to say a lot about this transmission and it is called maukhika parampara that is oral transmission oh, i told you just now there was no script at all and this oral transmission like i said the students or people would just hear it and learn it and therefore in vedic times 
knowledge is referred to as shruti that is that which is heard not read but heard and even today in india when somebody is very knowledgeable we don't say he is well read in the in our languages what we say is he is bahu shruta which means he has heard a lot he has learned a lot you are not going to believe me if i tell you the way they design the way of memorizing every sutra okay it is fantastic it is very logical it lives at its full proof there can be no mistake at all i will just give you there are eight different ways of saying the same line for example the first line uh, pankti of rugveda is agnim ile purohita so this you say clearly then agnim ile ile purohitam then agnim ile ile agnim you will not believe in this fashion there are dvajo shikha ratha this that eight types of ways of saying this and because of this when many of the sanskrit texts were burned down by the foreign aggressors rugveda survived every time why because people memorized it this is one great thing not only that our classical uh, music indian music when they say sare re ga ga ma you know we have done these alankaras once in our lifetime and these are also taken directly from the maukhika parampara of rugveda recitation you will be surprised that it is a sad thing that people don't know it not even women people who study veda know it but in 1991 when you know decided to give some uh, or publish some awards it was called global oral heritage oral in the sense uh, maukhika right the first prize of course went to the maukhika parampara of rugveda and we have to be proud of it and i definitely am and please spread this to as many people as you can so maukhika parampara is amazing thank you so much that's very enlightening and i think that also tells me how important the work of the sindhi culture foundation has been in capturing oral yes. traditions and oral histories of the sindhi yes. culture and peoples uh, because that is one of our most valuable resources um could we talk now a little bit about the society uh, society philosophy history and geography seen in rigvedic literature in the mm. context of the sindhu uh, so about the society uh, we would say that they, uh, these poems uh, they are around 1000 poems in uh, rigveda and what they do is that the uh, the person who has composed them the seer uh he is praising the deity and wh- why he is praising the deity of course he is fa- fascinated by the um, by uh, by the properties uh, by the by the qualities of the deity but one more most important uh, purpose behind this praise is that he wants his praise to be repaid that means he wants uh, uh, something more from the deity so um, it is a kind of uh, give and take instead of give and take i will i would say take and give so i am praising the deity and in return i am getting what i desire so this is the basic um, idea behind um, composing each and every sukta in rugveda uh, so what this um, poets they do uh, they first praise these um, in the first verses um, beginning verses of the poem uh, they praise the um, deity the god and uh, after that at the end uh, they give a list of their demands that i want this i want that i want uh, uh, i want wealth wealth is of course in the form of cattle because these people they were uh, they were pastoral <laughs> people and um, they were not settling at, at one place uh you can say uh, for some time they were settling uh, agriculture was uh, very meager 
so in the beginning they they just wanted cattle to be um, uh, to be their wealth uh, so uh, their first demand from the uh, gods is that they want uh, cattle in return and um, from uh, for moving from one place to another they wanted horses so horses is the other demand and um, i i will be very happy to tell you that one of the words for horse in sanskrit is sindhava that means who has born in the place of sindhu so horses is um, another demand somehow they had a, a kind of um, rivalry with other uh, groups of uh, them so they were fighting amongst each other for land for cattle and uh, that is why they they always wanted brave sons brave people uh, brave warriors so the demand of these poets is that they want veera putras very brave sons for fighting of course and uh, so these are some of the demands which show how was the society uh, that time so i just refer to uh, a kind of uh, wars or battles between these two uh, these uh, tribes so they were there were tribes among these vedic people uh, so they were uh, the names of these tribes they also uh, appear uh, in the in the rigveda and uh, there are uh, there are the uh, tribes such as trutsus or urus or anus and druyus and all of them they were fighting amongst each other for the position and for that what they wanted is that they wanted some god who will be their leader and uh, this position was given to indra so indra is their warrior god who is helping them who is giving them courage might and bravery for fighting amongst each other but at the same time when they are uh, when they are uh, praising uh, these uh, this indra to help them in wars uh, they know that wars are not uh, good battle is not good because nothing good happens out of fighting so these type of thoughts also appear uh, in the poems of rigveda so this is very important that uh their daily activity was fighting but still they knew the demerits of fight and they wanted the peaceful life this is a very important which i will i would like to share with you it seems that's a lesson we as humanity have not yet absorbed yes <laughs> thank you that was very enlightening uh, i okay. would like to add just i would like to add just one small thing to what she has said and that is about history now she was talking about history and the deities there was this big war called dasharadnya that is 10 kings okay so in this war they have described that it was fought on the banks of the rivers which is fine but one of the enemy fell down in sindhu and it the verse goes like shapa sindhu nam akrunod ashasti so even there at many places the name sindhu is mentioned though most of the times it is in the general sense of river sometimes it refers to the sindhu okay this is very important because this is how we we can correlate rigvedic culture and sindhu now if you would like to i would say something about philosophy yeah. okay the name veda itself means the word veda means knowledge okay and secondly what is philosophy see philosophy nowadays we use in a different sense altogether that i am doing my phd in philosophy and stuff like that but philo is love and sophia means knowledge so philosophy is love for knowledge and in this sense the entire veda is philosophy but coming to the modern context of the word philosophy i would still say one thing that the philosophy ultimately you know whichever philosophy it is it 
tries to go after that it seeks after the creation of the universe yes. whether you are a scientist like stephen hawking whether you are newton and doing quantum physics or whether you are a philosopher even einstein for that matter a mathematician but they all want to know about the creation of the universe and in rigveda there are such fantastic suktas on creation srushti utpatti i will mention only three shortly briefly first one is of course purusha sukta it is very famous that virat purusha that is a huge person from whom this is only metaphorical so we won't go into detail but the other two are scientific it's not only philosophic it's not only literary but it is also scientific the one is hiranya garbha samavarta tagre hiranya garbha a ball of gold that is a burning ball this is exactly what the big bang theory of modern days tells you so that ball it exploded it was uh, small pieces were made small in the sense i'm showing this size but huge ones and from that the stars and planets were created it is what rigveda tells you okay and the third one is the most beautiful the third one says na sadasi no sat asit tadani if i still am not able to understand this concept just see what it says there was neither existence nor non existence it's okay i can give you the literal translation but to really understand and grasp this concept is beyond me so it was like that so which means there was nothing okay and then salila meva guldamasi there was only deep water we know that on the earth there was only water first and after that from that water tamasa there was darkness and from that water then started becoming a matter came first okay this matter stephen hawking now calls as gold particle oh a oh god particle sorry and therefore you would see that whatever they have said is exactly pictured or portrayed in rigveda in different language and in different context the only thing is since we did not put it up scientifically and since there was no presentation made in a world science conference or something it remained in the background it remained in the darkness but philosophy is everywhere and amazing i mean you cannot even imagine how thousands of years ago people could think of that there is one thing which i do want to bring in here it is not about philosophy but let me tell you that sindhu sanskruti is fortunate because we have found two major sites mohenjodaro harappa and then there are many other sites we know but unfortunately for rigveda we still have not found any archaeological site and therefore we there are some sites and people say they are related to rigveda but people are not yet sure and for rigveda the only thing we say has its base on literary evidence okay so whatever is found in rigveda or other vedic literature we say that creation is one thing that is all right uh, but what we see today also means uh, in the advanced society we saw, uh, we see uh, that there are uh, people who are believers and who are non believers mm. uh, so in uh, in that time in rigveda which is the first literature uh, available to us uh, we see the uh, traits of that that there are some non believers also Uh, so there are people um, um, who are just amazed uh, with the with the activities of indra with the powers of indra and they somehow suspect that is this indra is reality or not it is like this that uh, they think that the gods are not existing 
and then what happens the indra uh, this indra himself he comes in front of them and he says that yes i am here and um, there are so many gods in rigveda and uh, it is uh, very interesting that when a poet is praising one god for him he is the ultimate powerful person powerful entity in the universe uh, at that time but uh, even then uh, there are some uh, there is a poem in uh, rigveda which says uh, that there are many gods that is okay uh, but ultimately they are one there is unity there is one god only ekam sat vipraha bahudha vadanti so it is only one the supreme reality uh, which came um, uh, as brahman in the later indian uh, philosophical traditions so that seed we can see uh, in this rigveda thank you that was incredibly fascinating um both dr suman dr paranjpe i really appreciate you know bringing to light the context of you know our ancient knowledge uh in the vedas uh with uh, science i think science is certainly you know uh the way we i i am a scientist um but the construct and the context of science is that it is the truth it is fact uh however that does not and should not exclude what else is fact knowledge and fact and science these are not necessarily disconnected uh so may we now talk a little bit about women in vedic literature at some point we've heard you know about the prayers for um the brave sons to fight but i think we also have heard very much about the uh, strong place that women have in vedic societies and cultures so i would love to hear a little bit more about that um i would like to say something on this first see women have had a very respectful position in the vedic literature and the, i always call it the role and position position is given to you by the society role is what you do for yourself right and in both these aspects rigvedic woman is somebody whom i envy i mean she really was so well treated and respected but even if we go back to sindhu sanskriti in mohenjodaro and harappa if you notice that famous nartika the dancers you know she is so famous just imagine in those days there was a dancer who was wearing so many necklaces her hand is full of bangles she is doing some kind of hair styling also so women were respected by the society and they were given their freedom especially in rigveda we see this very clearly but like i said you know we have literature which proves that and the, there girls are also equally welcome in the family okay which is important there are references i won't go into the details later on these girls they got educated remember in rigveda just as there are men who wrote these suktas there are 21 stree rushi that is female rushis who also not only wrote there uh, composed the suktas but the society thought of whosoever the editor was shakala so he thought that they were worth editing and being included in the samhita so women were well educated but the greatest thing about rigvedic society especially when it comes to women is that in rigvedic times the institution of marriage vivaha was well established so what does vivaha mean what does a marriage mean it's a social sanction moral sanction and legal sanction to the primordial relationship between a man and a woman or a male and a female right all over the world at that time there was no vivah but in rigveda it was and how did they choose the husbands the girls i mean since we are talking from their perspective let me say this when the girls became young the mother would deck them up 
she would do everything make their hair style chatushka parda hiranya pe that is they would embroider their garments with golden thread broken okay and these young girls and the young boys they would go to a gathering get together called samanam and there they chose their life partners isn't this amazing that this happened in uh, on the banks of sindhu and saraswati thousands of years ago what is very important is the family had complete faith in their daughters and at the same time also on society that my girl my daughter will not be taken undue advantage of which is very important then after marriage there is a vivaha sutra which describes that newly married girl as samradni samradni is the empress you know so she is the emperor of the house empress of the house and she rules the house not only that as a mother also she is very important um, they used to, the women used to do all kind of work during rigvedic times right so much so that there is one rushi called mudgala he wanted to go somewhere and he asked his wife mudgalani that can you give me a ride on the chariot today ratha so he didn't want to drive so she drove him and the description is fantastic it says she drove so fast generally all girls do that even today she drove so fast that her uttariya that is her dupatta chunri whatever you want to call it was fluttering in the wind all the time so such references tell us how 50 years back if a woman drove a scooter or a woman drove a car people would stop and look at her not so in rigveda but the best sukta which is written again by a woman indrani who is supposed to be the consort of indra himself is amazing we talk of feminism we talk of freedom for women this that they didn't need that you know they had that freedom already and what is the <clears throat> sukta what does it say she says aham ketu raham murda aham ugra vivachani she says i am the head of the family murda aham ketu i am the flag of the family that is the family is known by me and aham ugra vivachani i speak whatever comes to my mind i don't care so if she could say this and if the editor could include this which shows again that they women were great but at the same time this indrani is also a wonderful mother she praises her son and daughter exactly the same way you and me would do that like she says mama putro shatru hano my son can kill many enemies atho me duhita virat and my daughter is virat she is so great there are no words to describe and i always feel it is called the matrix of the civilization the role and position of women in any society we have, we are looking at various societies what happens to women that tells you the advancement of civilization and as a result ours is the only religion where there are female deities okay right from rigveda we have raka siniwali kuhu aditi this that many female deities and even later on we have shakti and then various forms of shakti but no other religion has it i mean not so many so when you defy a woman when you respect a woman it shows her position in the society that these uh, women um they uh, they had the right uh, to demand sex also uh, so there is one uh, stri rushi apala 
she she wishes to have union with indra himself and there is yami who wants to have sex with her brother and later on we have these norms that there should not be a sexual union between brothers and sisters and all that so that is the beginning of the civilization which we see uh, in these uh, suktas which are uh, composed by the women really fascinating to see the roots of these um you know norms of society could we talk a little bit now about uh, science in the rigveda we referred to it a little bit already in terms of creation uh, but what are the other aspects of science referred to in the rigveda did you amruta did you say a little bit then i can't because <laughs> there is so much in rigveda and the way science is you can see it you know there are no textbooks of course there are no textbooks but every time they build a ratha now to build a ratha they must know carpentry they must know uh, foundry because they the ratha nemi the ratha chakra is made out of iron and then small nails are there which are described in rigveda kh is the axle of the rigveda uh, of the ratha so you will realize that they knew all this the most sorry the most important thing is they talk about hiranya rajata and all these things they were fond of jewelry so you know where our love for jewelry comes from we we can say that we are keeping up the vedic tradition so this jewelry it's not easy you know they knew mining the jewel uh, jewels and even gold and silver you have to mine them that's the ore you have to purify them then you have to make it into alloys because pure gold cannot be made into jewelry so just imagine how much they knew i know for sure that um, diamonds need cutting right you have to kind of chamfer them and make them shine more and more rugvedic people obviously knew that otherwise how can they wear ratnani how can they wear rukma so this shows their love for science and science was seen everywhere but what i must talk about is their knowledge about mathematics and astrophysics now people would say that oh astrophysics it's a new branch of science what does rugveda have to do with that but no mathematics of course you know computation is one thing they knew very well and that is why astrophysics also developed now what is astrophysics we all know but the thing is in rugveda there are amazing things which are mentioned very clearly for example the first ever reference to a solar eclipse is found in the rugveda and this has been accepted the world over okay secondly rugveda talks about different types of uh, calendars for example it talks about solar calendar it talks about lunar calendar you know what this means it means that vedic aryan never thought that earth is stationary and sun moves around it they never thought so in the west who who always profess that they are the greatest scientist till 14th century they did not know that it the universe is not uh, geocentric it is heliocentric right but these people knew because of this solar and lunar calendar this is not the only two systems they talk about vatsara ida vatsara samvatsara parivatsara many different types and for that they need calculations there are references to nakshatra that is constellations so which means they knew the imaginary path of sun and the moon both how did they know that how did they know there are 27 constellations it's unbelievable and so to adjust the solar and lunar calendar in india even today we have a 13th month extra month extra lunar month to adjust it right 
that month is mentioned in Rugveda as Mari Munucha. The name is not important. What is important is how did they know that? How did they calculate everything? How did they know that seasons are formed because of the uh, Earth's rotation around the sun? How did they know that Earth revolves around its own axis? There is one sutta where a Rushi says to his friend, he's talking to a friend, and he says, I always wonder that when we are sleeping, that is when there is night in our country or our area, where does the sun go and give its light? Okay, so they knew that the sun goes somewhere else, antipode, as we call it. When we are having night, they, it goes to the antipode and gives its light. They knew this. This all, and this is, you know, like I said, it's not a textbook of science. So these are some scattered references from which we can imagine how science, science how much advanced science these people knew. And therefore I said, to talk a little bit, I have dropped so many things because there is constraint of time also, but a little bit of science is something which you cannot talk about in, when it comes to Rugveda. I'm glad. I'm glad there's not a little bit of science. Uh, <laughs> you talked about, uh, you know, astronomy and creation and ma certainly mathematics. I wonder if there's any references to the understanding of biology, which is, you know, obviously a subject that's relevant and of interest to me, or the understanding of how the human body works. There, of course, are references. Okay, and how the references come? Again, like I said, not a textbook. So the references come just by uh, scattered uh, context, you know. For example, when they talk about a human being as a man, okay, they talk about its various body parts. And you will be surprised, not exactly in the Rugveda, we don't find these references, but later on in other Vedic literature, we find references to everything I mean, his kidneys, Mutrapinda, Pliha, Splin, Rudaya, Kupusa, that is heart, lungs. I mean, now we call it lungs. In Vedic times, the left lung was called Kloma and the right lung was called Kupusa. You will be surprised that there is phonetics and the upper part of our teeth is called Barsvya. And they talk about this, which cannot be even translated into English because they don't know this at all. So anyway, they talk when a pashu, an animal, is offered in a yajna, it is dissected completely. And dissection makes you aware of anatomy, right? So they talk about various uh, parts of the body of an animal and they talk about something which is very important. It is called vapa. Vapa is omentum. In English, they call it omentum. It's a thin layer which is just below your skin and which covers your entire body. They were expert in this and they would take away the vapa and first offer that. So it is very, uh, I mean, since you are into biotechnology, I would, I would help you or I would uh, request you to read some of the books, you know, or some of the translations of the suttas, which will help you a lot, just to understand our tradition. That is very helpful. Thank you for pointing that out. I will look that up. Now we've talked about how, um, you know, the context of Rugvedic uh, literature, culture, etc., in terms of Sindhu and the uh, connections. Can we talk about some of the differences, if any, between Rugvedic culture and Sindhu culture? See, the most important difference is that Sindhu Sanskriti has got an archaeological site. And so you know how the houses were built, perfect town planning, drainage system, and this and that, and the beads. I have been to Lothal, which is a site where you can see the kiln where they make beads. It is amazing to see that. Unfortunately, 
for Rugveda, we don't have any such thing. We don't know about their town planning, but we know about their science. We know about their languages, about uh, the human beings in Sanskrit, Sindhu. We have no idea unless and until the script is deciphered, okay, which is a still an enigma. It is still not deciphered. We cannot say much with surety. But there is one thing which people say, and again, there is a controversy. Believe me, whenever there are two scholars, the controversy sets in. If you say A, I say B. Okay, so people say that Sindhu Sanskriti did not know horses, Ashwa. And why do they say that? Because no Ashwa, that is not Ashwa, but skeleton of a horse is found there. But there are people who now claim that no Ashwa is found in. No, it's your word against mine. And unfortunately, since we cannot go to Mohenjo-daro and Harappa site, we have to depend on someone else's um, opinions. Whatever things have been found in uh, Sindhu Sanskriti, like that small toy, you know, or the priest, there is also a small statue of a priest with so folded uh, cloth on his shoulder and all that thing. These are, I would say, very primary when you compare them to Vedic culture, which is advanced, as I told you, you know, they knew so much. If they can name the Saptarshi, the Ursa Major, and again, my problem is same. How did they identify them? How did they see that? And how did they know that near Vasishta, there is a smaller star, called, they called it Arundhati, because she was Vasishta's wife. But all such things, they must have existed even in Sindhu Sanskriti, but we don't know them. It was just washed away. Sindhu Sanskriti, for, and very unfortunately, was washed away, and therefore we cannot say much about it. I would look forward to listening to your forum now, you know, know more about it. No, thank you very much. Um, this has been a very fascinating discussion. It's taken us through uh, a lot of, um, you know, interesting information, uh, a lot of knowledge and a lot of food for thought uh, in terms of connecting Sindh and the Rug Vedas. I think for me, the most interesting discovery for myself through this talk has been in terms of how um, rich we are in terms of the knowledge of Sindh, the Sindhu, in terms of having the location. We have several yes. locations which tell us a lot. Um, and as you say, you know, the language I'm sure will, once um, it is deciphered, will be that much more. Yes, it will be and, great. And add to the layering and the complexity and, and making that come live. Um, the language and the knowledge that we have from the Rug Vedas yeah. is immense. Sorry, Can Rana. I just add one thing? Can I add one thing? Please do. It is kind of, you know, winding up the whole thing. But yeah. I would say that Sindhu Sanskriti and Vedic Sanskriti, they are like siblings. You know why? Because siblings have some characters which are very similar, very common. I mean, they are common amongst the them. And for some reason, for others, other qualities, they are pole apart, poles apart, right? So this happens. And therefore, I always say that forget about which came first and which came later, because it's difficult to say anything at this stage, but they run parallelly. Sindhu Sanskriti and Vedic Sanskriti, they run parallelly. Unfortunately, parallel lines do not meet. And therefore, we don't know whether they had a common source or anything or whether one developed out of the other or any such thing. Because I'm very sure even Sindhu Sanskriti must have had a lot of literature. Because literature always talks about your uh, civilization, your culture, your philosophy, your science, religion, religion in the sense, whatever your uh, worship was. But since we have lost that treasure, we have to keep quiet 
and say that these two are the parallel siblings. Thank you so much, Dr. Paranspe. I think uh, that is, I hope that none of us keep quiet. I hope that uh, all of us will in some way or the other chase that knowledge and try to discover oh, yes. the links uh, and the connections and that perhaps even the opposing perspectives will do more to egg everyone on to discover what the interconnections are and build the story further. So thank you very much. This has been Pleasure. a fascinating conversation and we yeah. really appreciate your time for the Sindhi Culture Foundation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Ajba utra paar de taare ki tawar Ajba utra paar de taare ki tawar Har na Har na har sambara Mujha sarata sangar अज प मुझे यार वसन गावे सकियां अज प उतर पार दे ओ अज प उतर पार दे ककर तो कार करे अज प उतर पार दे ककर तो कार करे वसे तो वड पड़ो कालक खंड भरे विजन न सान वरे मुझे सकार न सुख दिए हो तो के सिंधिली सारे वे हो तो के सिंधिली सारे वे